So without any further ado, I will hand over to Sue. Thank you very much, Hilary, and thank you very much indeed to um, Elizabeth and to Tula for being main swings on organising this seminar. Um, it gives me great pleasure to chair um, both sessions. We are going to be running till half past three in the first session. Um, Tim and Tula will be talking first, and then Martin will be making some discussant remarks and we'll be opening it to uh, questions from the audience. We'll take a short break, then in about 15 minutes, uh, before convening again for the second session. Uh, when Elizabeth and Rob will be talking. So it gives me great pleasure um, to welcome um, Tula Simpson and also um, Tim Gibbs. Tim will be speaking first. Um, Tim is going to be talking on... Thank you, Mandela and um, Matanzima, attorneys at law, lawyers, the legal field of liberation. Tula will then be speaking, Nelson Mandela and the genesis of the ANC's armed struggle, notes on method. And uh, Tim has prepared um, a number of printouts rather than an AB session. Um, so, Tim lectures in African history at UCL. His first book, Mandela's Kinsman, Nationalist Elites and the Apartheid First Bantustan, provides a new interpretation of the relationship between ethnicity and nationalism during the decades of insurgency in southern Africa. He is currently working on a research project which looks at um, how the transformation of patterns of migration collapsed apartheid's patterns of spatial segregation. This research has been undertaken in conjunction with the University of Svartisrand in Johannesburg and funded by the South Africa National Research Foundation. Uh, Tim, if I could invite you to speak first and then I'll introduce yeah. you. If we could just reverse that. Um, oh, yeah, I just let me stop. Because uh, I'm I in apologize. the early 1960s and we just thought that if I go first and then um, Tim goes second. In which case I need to puff minus. you up. So, <laughs> Tula <laughs> Simpson, <laughs> <less> to say. <laughs> Tula Simpson uh, teaches at the Department of Historical and Heritage Studies at the University of Pretoria. Tula Simpson has published extensively on the ANC's armed struggle and organization's relationship with popular protest movements in South Africa. His most recent publications are Nkonto Wisizwe, The ANC's Armed Struggle, published in 2016, and The ANC and the Liberation Struggle in South Africa, Essential Writings, published this year or coming out this, this year? year this Excellent. Year. Well, Tula, in which case, if you could begin, please, then, talking on Nelson Mandela and the genesis of the ANC's armed struggle. Thank you. One of the main criticisms of the genre of biographies of Mandela is the whole notion of him as being this sanctified figure. I uh, remember Ahmed Dangor, the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, saying that even he acknowledged that there was a need for more critical perspectives of his life, and he felt that they would only really come into circulation after Mandela's death. Even before Nelson Mandela passed away in 2013, there was the emergence of new, more critical um, accounts of Mandela's early life especially, and they emerged within the historiography of the ANC's armed struggle, of which um, Nelson Mandela played a critical role as the founder of Mkwantu Assis, where the ANC's military wing. The charge sheet against Mandela based on these new historical accounts are the following. Firstly, that he lied repeatedly during his life um, over <coughs> the fact that he was a member of the South African Communist Party in the early 1960s at that critical time when MK, which is the abbreviation of Mkwantu Asizwa, was being uh, formed. Secondly, that this concealment was part of an attempt to cover up the fact that it was actually the South African Communist Party rather than the African National Congress which was responsible for the formation of Mkwantu Asizwa. Furthermore, that the move to launch Mkwantu Asizwa was in direct violation of an ANC directive which forbade Mandela and his colleagues to take that step. And lastly, that the whole process involved um, Nelson Mandela marginalizing the then ANC president, um, Albert Batuli, and effectively rendering him a lame duck. Now, cumulatively, these four charges are devastating to Nelson Mandela's reputation, whether it be as an activist um, during his career in South African politics, and secondly, as a chronicler of events. My presentation is based on a paper which has been accepted for the Journal of Southern African Studies. I'd be welcome to circulate the uh, version of the paper as it exists now with anybody who's um, interested in it. I'm using this presentation as a primer to non-specialists about, um, firstly, the source material on which the debate is based and the kind of interpretations that have been extant in the secondary literature. The late Stephen Ellis is the most prominent figure involved in this reconceptualization of the 
Nelson Mandela's role in the process leading up to the formation of Nkuntu Asizwe. And his view that uh, Nelson Mandela was a uh, South African Communist Party member at this decisive period rests on two main pieces of evidence. The first is accounts from veterans of the South African Communist Party, and he numbers seven of them, who all say that uh, Nelson Mandela served in the party alongside themselves during that period. Also, Mandela's presence attested to by many at South African Communist Party Central Committee meetings during the relevant period, and why would he be there if he wasn't a member, goes the argument. These two pieces of evidence are cumulatively decisive, according to Ellis' interpretation, in proving Mandela's party membership. The two people I, who, I, who I would say have led the critique of Ellis' interpretation are uh, Vern Harris, um, he's also from the Nelson Mandela um, Foundation, as well as Hugh McMillan, who's the author of a book called The Lusaki Years, um, The ANC in Exile in Zambia. Now, their critique of um, Ellis is that he, according to them, misinterpreted the nature of the underground at that critical period. What we're speaking about is a time in the aftermath of the Sharpeville massacre, the declaration of a state of emergency, and the banning of the ANC. And their argument is that in that maelstrom following those three events, activists from the liberation movement moved underground and they operated without resort to issuing party cards or drawing up detailed membership lists. And there's two consequences of that, which according to these critiques mean that we can't render a verdict and we may never be able to render a verdict on the question on which Ellis de delivered a definitive answer. The first is that this is an underground which is operating without respecting certain formalities. How do we know that they would have gone to the trouble of respecting the formality of inducting Mandela officially into the party in 1960, which is the date that Ellis says that um, Mandela joined the party? They say it's perfectly plausible that they never actually went through that formality. Secondly, if they did, how would we know? I mean, they, in terms of surviving documents such as party cards or membership lists or those kind of empirical resources on which we would de deliver a verdict, how would we ever be able to find that? The counsel of um, uh, Macmillan and Harris is that we are best to say that we just don't know and we may never be able to tell definitively. The last work that Ellis um, delivered was an article which was produced in Cold, the journal Cold War History, the first issue of 2016, titled Nelson Mandela, the South African Communist Party and the Origins of Mkwantu Asizwe. There are a couple of ways in which he integrates these. They haven't appeared in his earlier articles, but these are following the observations which Ellis makes and, um, in that article. He wrote that in an underground party, the SACP did not issue membership cards. Members were not required to swear an oath of allegiance or to undergo any formal rite of initiation. That's a sort of concession or an acknowledgement of the points which his critics have made about the blurred boundaries in the underground as they existed at the time. And Ellis offered this fact of underground operation as a factor which might actually be able to resolve the whole dispute. And putting the piece of the puzzle together, he resolved the riddle of Nelson Mandela's party membership as followed. He claimed that Nelson Mandela's repeated denials during his lifetime that he joined the party, quote, also owed something to a legal pedantry that was in keeping with his professional training. Using his lawyer's skills, he could argue that, never having sworn an oath, signed an agreement, or undergone any membership rights, he had never accepted party membership, end quote. My observation of that would be that if Ellis is correct, then Nelson Mandela's repeated denials that he ever actually joined the party would basically be factually correct. If he never went through any process of joining the party, then his denial that he ever became a party member would simply be factually true. The thing to remember about this in delivering a verdict is that nobody ever denied that Mkwantu Asizu was, was a joint project. If you read Long Walk to Freedom, Mandela gives credit to Joe Slovo and he says that it was a unification of the South African Communist Party's underground units with the ANC's underground units building a joint functional military unit. The only difference in this whole debate is whether the formality of Mandela joining the party was ever undertaken. Was there ever any, ever 
um, any actual process undertaken. Now at this point you might ask, what does it matter if this formality was undertaken, if it doesn't really change anything in substance? The reason why it matters is the following, and I'll quote from um, um, Stephen Ellis and what, he's, and what he said about this, quote, Those South Africans who think, so what, when they learn that Nelson Mandela was an SACP member are wrong. They need to understand that the armed struggle was originally the work of the SACP, decided at a conference in Emerentia in December 1960 that was attended by just 25 people. Nelson Mandela was one of the few black people present, end quote. That is um, from one of the articles that he wrote on the topic. It's based on this larger point. So it's not just a, it's not just a technical question about whether a formality was um, observed. It's part of a larger historiographical argument about the road to armed struggle, which is that if, and I'm going to discuss how he develops this argument, if Mandela was a member of the South African Communist Party, it proves that the armed struggle was the work of the South African Communist Party rather than the ANC. I'm just going to discuss his argument behind that and the significance of it and why it matters. And we need to focus on the December 1960 conference because he says that's the um, key pieces, um, piece of, piece of um, key event that we need to consider there. Now there's two sources of evidence that Ellis relies on in his account of the um, December 1960 meeting. The first is a memo which appeared in the, Ronnie, the papers of um, Ronnie Castles, which were deposited in the um, historical papers at the University of the Witwatersrand, where he reads a memorandum which outlined the resolutions of that meeting where the, it called on the party to, quote, prepare the nucleus of an adequate apparatus to lead struggles of a more forcible and violent character. That, along with a passage from the memoirs of Rusty Bernstein, are two pieces of evidence that led um, Ellis to declare that what the SSCP decided in December 1960 was on what he called a declaration of war. And this is the basis of his argument that the ANC was bounced, in his words, into forming him into a where by its alliance partner, the South African Communist Party. Remember that December 1960 is a year before Mkwantu Assis were formally launches. So we're speaking about the chronology towards the formation of MK. Ellis's argument is that within the South African Communist Party there's the doctrine of democratic centralism, which means that once a decision is reached, everybody has to abide by it and seek to ensure its implementation. If Mandela was a party member, he would have been under party discipline. And why that's significant is that that would invalidate a great deal of material in Long Walk to Freedom, where Nelson Mandela says in the early months of 1961, he was earnestly trying to um, secure a peaceful resolution. And it was only once the regime had made clear, especially after the anti-republic demonstrations were suppressed in May 1961. It's only after that that he turned to Mkwantu Asizwa. If Ellis is correct, then this would have been a sham. He would have been operating throughout 1961 as a disciplined South African Communist Party member. The South African Communist Party would have decided what it had wanted to do. It would have decided on an armed struggle, and Nelson Mandela would have been um, duty-bound to follow the party line. So there's two things that it did. So that, that's why it matters whether he was a party member. And there's the ambiguity there that um, people have pointed out. The other is, did the 1960 meeting commit the South African Communist Party to a declaration of war? It's critical. If it did, then you know the argument has credence. If it didn't, then the argument does not have credence, because even if he was a party member, it becomes, if he was a party member, he still wouldn't have been bound to try and move towards armed struggle, because that wouldn't have been the South African Communist Party's policy. Now, something which Tom Lodge pointed out, he, it's the same um, memorandum in the Castrol's papers. It's literally those three paragraphs. I should have prepared it on the OHP. But basically, there's three points, A, B, and C. And under section B, as, as Tom Lodge points out, um, there's a line which says that steps should be taken to ensure that the whole people's movement reconsidered its tactics 
of exclusive reliance on non-violent methods, and that a campaign of education and explanation be carried out throughout the movement to prepare for forcible forms of struggle when these became necessary or desirable. What Tom Lodge emphasized was the necessary or desirable and the conditional that this was not a decision which was being taken then and there. It was a provisional decision according to the wording of this resolution, and that being a factor which Lodge, sorry, which Ellis had overlooked. Secondly, if we go to the Rusty Bernstein memoirs, um, the passage, the relevant passage there, and I read again, quote, we managed only a short discussion before the conference had to end. We took what was no more than an interim decision. The South African Communist Party Central Committee would consider the matter further, but in the meanwhile, it was to set up small specialist units in all districts to familiarize themselves with the practice and techniques of forms of armed struggle. The party and the ANC were moving in the same direction, but not quite on parallel tracks. How I would read that is that that underpins what Lodge said with regards to the resolution, which is that this is a provisional statement. It says that discussions would need to be undertaken within both the ANC and the South African Communist Party before any definitive decision could be reached to go to armed struggle. We're going over the minutiae of texts leading up to the armed struggle, but I hope I've explained clearly why it's so critical. Because if it's not a definitive declaration of war, then the argument of the SSEP having bounced the ANC into armed struggle doesn't apply. Nelson Mandela would have been perfectly free to continue pursuing peaceful solutions in 1961 without violating any tenet of party discipline, even if he was a party member. I want to move on to discuss the argument about the ANC um, not endorsing the armed struggle. This is where the research of Ellis um, makes junction with the biographical work by Scott Cooper on the life of Albert um, Lutuli, uh, most importantly in a book which Cooper wrote um, called Bound by Faith, which is a biography of Albert Lutuli. I want to begin by reading um, Cooper's account of Lutuli's response when Nelson Mandela raised the possibility of armed struggle. According to Cooper, Lutuli, quote, argued that the ANC received its mandate from the grassroots. The ANC could not make such a massive policy alteration, strict non-violence to an armed struggle, without the consultation and retraining, ideologically speaking, of the membership. Cooper added, they worked all night to convince Lutuli, and eventually the physical vigor and the rhetorical tenacity of the young lions must have fatigued the older man. The point to make about this is that it comes in a passage that falls between two endnotes which both reference page 322 of Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom. So therefore, according to the sources, the account on which this testimony is based is Nelson Mandela's autobiography. If we turn to that page of Mandela's autobiography, however, it does not refer to Lutuli as having advanced the arguments attributed to him. After acknowledging, quote, that the chief initially had resisted my arguments, Mandela said, for him, Mandela added that, quote, for him, i.e. for Lutuli, nonviolence was not simply a tactic, end quote. Mandela said nothing further about the actual content of Lutuli's contributions. Mandela's account also did not support the suggestion that fatigue was the principal factor that overcame Lutuli's initial objectives, objections. Mandela wrote instead that, quote, we worked on him the whole night, and I think that in his heart he realized we were right. He ultimately agreed that a military campaign was inevitable. I want to also deal with um, Cooper's treatment of the resolution reached by that meeting because it's important with regards to getting clarity on whether the ANC ever endorsed the move to armed struggle or not. Regarding the resolution that was reached, um, Cooper wrote in Bound by Faith that, quote, to placate Latuli, the CJE, the, Council, the Congress Joint Executive, so it's the ANC, the South African Indian Congress, the Coloured People's Congress, they all met jointly to consider the matter. They resolved to keep the organisations, i.e. the ANC and the new military formation, separate, and that the members of the CJE decided to allow the formation, but not the launch, of Mkwonto Esizwe. The thing about this is that, once again, long walk to freedom, going by the references, and that's all we've got, the source on which Cooper's account is based, 
is Long Walk to Freedom. And Mandela there simply wrote that, quote, towards dawn there was a resolution. The Congress has authorized me to go ahead and form a new military organization separate from the ANC. The policy of the ANC would still be that of nonviolence. I was authorized to join with whomever I wanted or needed to create this organization. I would not be subject to the direct control of the mother organization, end quote. There's nothing in this source about fatigue or placation being the factors responsible for the resolution, or to the resolution having decided to permit only, quote, the formation, but not launch of what became MK. With regards to um, fatigue or placation, another quote from Cooper there is that, quote, it was likely that complete exhaustion rather than carefully reasoned consensus allowed a resolution to be accepted at dawn. The point I would make there is that all we can go by with regards to Ellis, um, Cooper's account of this resolution and this meeting are the sources that he provides. And there's a discrepancy between the source material and the conclusion which he reaches. And in this case, the discrepancies are decisive because Mandela's account alone is not sufficient to reach a conclusion that the ANC never endorsed the move to armed struggle. But, and Ellis says that the ANC didn't endorse the move to armed struggle, but there's that discrepancy between the source that he uses. And so, if we just use this, I, 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 don't, I don't think, based on the source that he's provided, that's a sustainable argument. The last one I want to do, uh, discuss is the fourth of the um, four arguments is the idea that um, Nelson Mandela secured um, Lutuli's marginalization in moving to form from Quinto Asizwa. This is again a place where the interpretations of Ellis and um, Cooper have junction with each other. Ellis wrote about this, that um, this SSP's role in Mkuntu Asiva was particularly evident in Natal, where the ANC's provincial leadership had never been canvassed for its views on armed struggle. Ellis added, the situation in Natal reflected the personal authority of Albert Latuli in that province and his lack of enthusiasm for an armed struggle. These factors caused the Johannesburg militants to bypass ANC structures in Natal when recruiting for Mkuntu Asiswe. It's based again on Cooper's research, and Cooper says that the silences in the narrative, especially from operatives in Natal, reveal that Lutuli was not involved directly or indirectly in the strategic implementation of violence. He stated further that MK operatives silence about Lutuli when recalling events surrounding 16 December 1961 convey that he did not instruct, advise, or know about MK's launch. What Cooper has to say about this is that the real circumstances of the ANC's turn to arms struggle have been obscured by ANC politicians making propaganda in the present which have obscured the reality of the past. Something worth noting there is that one of these sort of um, ANC politicians who he critiques um, in this regard for having distorted the past is Billy Nair. And in one of his um, writings he points out that Billy Nair claimed that Lutuli, quote, already knew before he left for Oslo to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. He knew that night that Mkwantu Asizu was going to be launched. Chief is safe in his home, nine o'clock that night. Throughout South Africa, there were bombings taking place, end quote. Now, the inclusion of this critique of Nair, combined with the repeated statements about the silences in the narratives of MK veterans in Natal, suggests an ignorance of the fact that Billy Nair was actually the chairman of the MK detachment which started operations in Natal on the 16th of December 1961. So insofar as the idea that Lutuli was marginalized rests on the narrative, the silences in the narratives of MK cadres in Natal, we've basically got the chairman of the MK cadres in Natal who launched operations on 16th of December 1961 saying, look, chief was consulted. And we could actually go further because the person who took over from Billy Nair was somebody by the name of Koenig and Luvu. And what the um, uh, South African Democracy Education Trust, their series, it points out him saying, we were consulting Lituli in the build up to the ANC's armed struggle. That also has to be borne in mind with regards to the arguments of Lut uh, Mandela having uh, marginalized Lituli during this process. The works by Cooper and Ellis were produced in the late 2000s and early 2010s, just before um, Mandela died. Just after um, Nelson Mandela's death, the ANC and the South African Communist Party both um, released statements 
saying that Mandela was a member of the South African Communist Party Central Committee, South African Communist Party Central Committee in the early 1960s. Both Stephen Ellis and Irina, Irina Filatova, it, so that, that was, you had this dispute, was he or wasn't he? Then Mandela died, then the ANC and the SSCP both released these statements, and Ellis and Filatova took this as being the clincher, the decider, the fact that it's beyond reasonable doubt that Mandela was a member of the Central Committee during this um, period. If I were to give a verdict on what I would say the consensus is at the moment, I would say that some say he pro the, the general idea is that he probably was a member. The debate is over whether this actually matters or not, and what's the significance of this. There's a tendency to say that, yeah, he probably was, but it doesn't really matter and it doesn't really change anything. I would say it does matter if Mandela is to survive this dispute with any semblance of credibility for his integrity intact, because it literally would mean that he spent most of his life lying blatantly, including in his memoirs. There's another reason why it matters. Ellis proclaimed in um, External Mission that this is basically a regurgitation of what he took to be the South African um, police's verdict on the matter. And this is a factor which troubled uh, Macmillan especially. He viewed it as part of a campaign to rehabilitate certain legends of the old apartheid regime. And if you look at the way in which this is being communicated, uh, Politics Web, for example, it's a, it's a news blog within South Africa, and um, the editor there is James Mayberg, and he says, based on what this debate has been able to reveal regarding the facts of the road to arms struggle. We can't believe a word that um, Nelson Mandela said about his role in the struggle. It would be true if um, he was a member of the South African Communist Party. That's what, it, what is at stake there. And there's also a critique of um, what is characterized in these pieces as being naive Western liberals who believed um, what the liberation movement told them, and they ignored what was often factual, credible, information from the old South African security regime. Something um, worth noting with regards to what we characterize the views of the old apartheid regime to be. General Hendrik Vandenberg was the chief of the security police and later security secretary for security intelligence in South Africa in the 1960s and 1970s. In 1980, he added his support to a campaign to free Nelson Mandela. When the argument, the main argument against this step was put to him, namely people who said that Mandela had been a member of the South African Communist Party prior to his arrest in 1962, Vandenberg responded, quote, I know the man's history well, and I challenge anyone to produce one shred of evidence to prove that Mandela was a member of the Communist Party. That is simply not so, end quote. It is therefore simply not true that the South African security branch concluded that Mandela was a member of the Communist Party. They were working on the documents related to the case. And based on the documents which Vandenberg was more privy to than anybody else, his verdict was, no, Mandela was not a member of the South African Communist Party. This is an area of ongoing research. As I speak, it's a vital field within Southern African studies, and um, Paul Landau is working on a manuscript about the um, early years of MK. Uh, ben, Carton and Robin, ben Carton and Robert Vinson are working on the um, life of Latuli. It's possible that they may unearth um, evidence which is relevant um, to the debates at hand. But with regards to our present state of evidence and the evidence on which the accusations of, of Mandela's party membership, of the SSCP bouncing the ANC into armed struggle, Mandela not having a mandate to form MK, Mandela um, marginalising Albert Latuli. Where we are, and I'm basing this on the evidence which is produced in these works which are making these claims and um, going through the evidence which has been produced for them, I would like to, in conclusion, just turn to something which uh, Vern Harris wrote in one of his increasingly defensive pieces, because by the time he wrote this, there was this idea that he's basically on the ropes, and it's more or less been confirmed that Mandela was a member of the party. He, as for Nelson Mandela, Vern Harris wrote... 
He counseled that we, quote, remain open to the possibility that Mandela was telling the truth, end quote. And I would say there's no reason reading through this material in light of our present knowledge for us to do anything other than that. Thank you very much. Um, Tim, do you want to speak in the room? Yeah. Okay, so first, apologies. I am changing nappies at 3 a.m. I remembered to print out a copy of the handout. I forgot to bring my USB stick with me. I hope. Most of you can see a copy. Um, secondly, um, this very brief excursion for me into legal history is something new. Um, these ideas are provisional. I look forward to your comments. Um, what I want to do in this talk today is think about Mandela, the lawyer. Um, firstly, broadly speaking, the legal profession in South Africa produced many of the leading anti-apartheid politicians, famously Mandela and Tambo, attorneys at law. You see a picky of them, um, uh, bottom of page one. Um, secondly, I guess this is where our talks in some sense intersect in a way, but in time Mandela's moral authority would come from this kind of liberal narrative about the importance of law in opposing uh, an illegal apartheid. You see these in narratives of Mandela's long walk to freedom, intersecting with accounts of like um, Bezos's Odyssey to freedom. Um, if you can't see the subtitle, it's too small, uh, but it is, he says himself, a memoir by the world-renowned human rights advocate, friend and lawyer to Nelson Mandela. If you need to sell a book, um, I guess you've got to sell it like that. Um, and I think Saul Dubois' recent book slash essay, South Africa's Struggle for Human Rights, is really excellent discussion of some of the issues that are at stake here. One other thing to point out, I think, is that Johannesburg was very often the hub of these struggle lawyers, of these human rights lawyers, who played such a crucial role. But yet, throughout South Africa's 20th century, the chieftaincy areas, the native reserves, scare quotes, have produced many, sometimes the bulk, of South African lawyers. Um, Mandela himself was offered a legal partnership in Umtata by his cousin or nephew, depending on how you want to define it, Kaiser Matanzima, this chap you see on the top um, slide, 1943. And that's the counterfactual behind the title. Indeed, when um, Matanzima rules the Transkei Bantu Stan, from 63 onwards, the Transkei has more African attorneys at law in the mid-70s than Johannesburg and Durban combined. And likewise, if you turn over, um, what you see, I hope graphically represented, is the majority of black judges on the Constitutional Court since 94. Well, two-thirds of them, early year career training in the Bantu stands, and almost everyone possible exception of Mosineke, um, whose autobiography is being ordered through Amazon as we speak, um, were educated in the Bantu stands. So in this talk, what I want to suggest is to mesh together, um, on the one hand, um, this, 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 this trajectory of lawyers trained in the Bantu stands, mesh that history, those professional trajectories, together with the better known history of the Johannesburg lawyers. Mandela on the one side, shall we say Matanzima's Transkei on the other. And then perhaps with the conclusion to think about by implication what might be the significance of these legal histories at a time when in South Africa constitutionalism, the judiciary, is something that's up for debate, under attack even. My suggestion is we know a huge amount about the, the struggle lawyers, the human rights lawyers in Johannesburg, the human rights lawyers who drafted the constitution, but perhaps not as much as we ought to know about, say, Chief Justice McQuay, you know, who born, trained, practiced in Bokhut and Swan. That's where I hope to go. Section 1, just to start by sketching briefly the mid-20th century legal landscape. When Mandela and Tambo formed their legal partnership in 1952 in Joburg, they're doing something very new. Till then, South Africa's segregationist cities, very tight circuits of um, commerce, 
by and large, excluded African lawyers from these lucrative you know, circuits of commerce and law. Um, Ixley Serna, his, um, he had a law practice uh, with Mangana, um, which falls in the mid-1920s. The most successful of that generation, um, George and Siwa, um, he practices in rural Palakwane, and I think the bulk of his practice came from the Baron chieftaincy. Um, lucrative, uh, the, the richer parts of the chieftaincy defending them in the aftermath of the 1913 Land Act. Now, with the growth of cities, the 40s, the 50s, rapid urbanisation, the scarecrow's blackfoot that overwhelmed the segregated cities, this is when there are new opportunities for that new generation to, defend, to develop practices defending an African clientele. And Mandela's memoirs are eloquent here. Quotes, every day we heard and saw the thousands of humiliations that ordinary Africans confronted in their everyday lives. You know, his, his legal practice based on that, um, on, 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 on this work. Also important to remember, black lawyers, very important political leaders at this time. Law is an elite profession, only uh, 50 lawyers um, practicing African attorneys. Um, in 1960, as opposed to 100 doctors, 26,000 teachers. And also law being a disputatious um, process, courtroom performances being at times as exciting as soap operas. Um, this is how Mandela builds his prominence, first amongst the equals of that you know, small group of ANC Youth League lawyers um, um, at the forefront of debate. And of course we know that story best in Johannesburg, that slew of memoirs, um, Bezos, um, Slovo, and of course Mandela too. So if that Joe Berg narrative is well known, at the, same, at the same time, 40s, 50s, with the growth of um, the peasant revolts, um, there's a new set of rural struggles coming into rural courtrooms. Um, and this map, you can see bottom of page 3, some sense of, um, of, of, of the key peasant revolts. Mandela himself was taking court cases when um, he wasn't under banning orders, he needed special permission, Everywhere from the Eastern Transvaal all the way down to Ngogo, a thousand kilometres apart. Perhaps more importantly than that, there's a set of lawyers in the rural Eastern Cape, perhaps 20% of lawyers at this time, early 50s, 60s, sorry, one third of lawyers, practicing in the trans sky. And some of them are coming from um, alternative political traditions to the ANC. On page 4 you see two key PAC lawyers who practice in the trans sky, both trained with um, Kaiser Matanzima's brother, so their articles with him. More significantly, uh, the All Africa Convention that you, Colin, has uh, written about in other contexts. Wicked Sotsi was the leader of the AAC at the time, and he was jocularly known as the King of the Tembus, in part because A, his practice was very lucrative, these are the offices he built on um, White's own land, he had to go to court to build those offices. Um, he was also confronting Matanzima in court at that time, confronting the Bantustan project in court, confronting Matanzima's breakaway chieftaincy in court pretty successfully until his group of lawyers got crushed by a whole set of emergency laws. And that's probably where we um, finish this kind of sketch of the mid-20th century with um, legal repression, also a whole failure of armed struggles, sending many of these political lawyers into exile, but at the same time, Mandela is snatching a symbolic victory, perhaps from that defeat with the Rivonia trial, making him and that legal team around him the icon of a, a global emerging human rights movement. You know, it's uh, London, IDAF, 
uh, funding, Harvard scholars sitting in the Rivonia courtroom, verdict denounced by the UN. That's where he uh, becomes that icon, perhaps, for the first time. By contrast, um, section two, thinking about the next generation of African lawyers who would spend much of their formative years in the Bantu stands from the mid-60s onwards, not least um, constitutional court judges. Um, Matanzuma is particularly well known um, for being a, um, a place in which the legal profession develops. Perhaps four key institutional mechanisms. Firstly, the growth of bureaucracy, not least the Africanisation of legal posts once held by white officials. And somewhere, bottom of page four, Pius Langer, Chief Justice Pius Langer, spent the first 16 or 17 years of his career rising from a court interpreter to a district magistrate um, before he then goes to the Natal Bar in Durban. So trajectory, you can see in red, than by many other, other prominent legal figures. Second, the four Bantu stands that take full independence establish their own separate court divisions with their own separate societies of attorneys and advocates and eventually their own judicial benches, judicial benches filled out with African judges. And in Transkei Matanzuma, in particular, relaxes legal regulations allowing African lawyers who don't have an LLB into the commercial law from which they've previously been excluded. Linked to that, thirdly, are the quick profits promised by all those Bantu Stan um, projects, hotels, casinos, at times corrupt, attracting a whole slew of um, businessmen and commercially minded lawyers. And all sorts of evasive memoirs about this moment in history from um, the memoirs of David Bloomberg, a man of theatre, lawyer, businessman, and former mayor of Cape Town, who was involved with Saul Kersner and caught up in corruption charges in the trans sky to, um, this is um, T.T. Lechlarker's wife, who writes a memoir about how this former PAC lawyer, um, lecturing law in exile in uh, London Polytechnic, gets attracted back to uh, the trans sky, um, to Matanzuma's government in the mid 70s, and that Larker throws himself right into the middle of this corrupt, spoils politics. Yet I think it's important to say at the, su the same time, this Bantustan version of, shall we say, black economic empowerment isn't just about a tight-knit nexus of corrupt interests. In the mid-1980s, the biggest black law firm in the whole of South Africa is Sangoni Partners. Head offices on Tata, and they do a lot of um, human rights work, political dissidents getting people out of jail. And they cross subsidise this work with easy profits made from basically mortgages, land registrations, conveyancing. As a new generation of black professionals are moving into Bantustan housing, which had once been racially zoned. People like Demisa and Sabeza who was big on the, tru uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, well known as a very uh, 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 prominent advocate today. He's a partner at Sangoni Partners. Temba Sangoni himself just retired as the judge president of the Eastern Cape Court. Biggest law firm, black law firm in the mid-80s. Fourth point, um, being that the Bantu stands um, need magistrates um, in their bureaucracy. So by the mid-80s, there are probably about 40 law bursary places every year offering, famously, I guess, McQuang, you know, son of a, um, um, basically his mum and dad have got two years education between them. But he gets to university, gets a law bursary from Bop, to the University of Zululand. These kinds of trajectories very 
important. And also the universities in themselves sometimes um, are important centres of, 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 shall we say, professional training and legal disputation. University of Transkei and Botswana in particular um, uh, don't teach by road. Um, have all sorts of interesting lawyers um, lecturing, um, not least John Flolpe at uh, the University of Transkei. And so this is how, in many ways, the Bantustans are producing this new generation um, of lawyers, who some of whom will go on and play prominent roles in post-apartheid South Africa. Just a very small tangent at the top of page six. It's just kind of interesting that key parts of the ANC underground were bursary law students. Um, both in the Eastern Cape and Kazoom Natal. These, you know, these are names we're perhaps aware of um, if, you study, um, if you study the underground. To conclude, in many ways, segregation is hugely, of course, it's hugely important in apartheid South Africa. Lawyers produced by the Bantustan projects in many ways are marginal. Tender Sangoni's law firm, they make their money from mortgages. By contrast, George Bezos at the Joburg Bar, when he's not defending Mandela, he's taking his brief from mining houses. These, you know, tensions are still playing themselves out. At the same time, I hope I've suggested how Bantu stands, in all sorts of ambiguous ways, could be important hubs, were important hubs of professional and political formation. Things change somewhat. Section 3 in the 1980s, thinking about the growing importance of black city lawyers once again, signalled by the establishment of the Black Lawyers Association in 1977, of course just one year after Soweto. It's a time when legal, political space is opening up in the cities, and the Black Lawyers Association, one of the, kind of the sparks which leads to its formation is black lawyers needing to get around the racial zoning of town centres to be able to set up their law um, offices um, um, in, 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 in city centres. In some ways, the uh, resemblance to the legal battles of the mid 20th century striking, there's even a direct Mandela connection. The first chair of the Black Lawyers Association is um, the ANC veteran, Godfrey, um, I think it's gone, Kiki, I think, yes, he had trained with Mandela and Tambo in, in their law firm in the 50s. Nonetheless, Bantu stands remain important um, in the 80s, um, and there are some key knots of, of, of lawyers who trained in the Bantu stand, particularly Kwazulu and Natal, who then go to the Durban bar, or from the Botswana and go to Johannesburg, and sometimes bounce back again, like the way. The largest of the lawyers is, is, is probably Durban. And this is really important at a time when um, Charter's politics, UDF politics, is trying to expand out of the cities into the repressive Bantu stands using human rights discourses as a means of opening up political space. Um, give an example, Yvonne um, Mahoro, she um, opens the first branch of the ANC in Botswana in 1990. She's also very involved in the Matakeng Anti-Repression Forum. You see people like Kaya uh, Slanger doing similar things in KwaZulu. And this is probably at a time in the early 1990s when it seems that homeland leaders like Butelezi might tip the constitutional negotiations in favour of the apartheid government, but opening up of space from below by the UDF. Very often these kinds of struggle lawyers going out there um, is pretty important. Lawyers for human rights, perhaps a elite, liberal, loaded word, white organisation in the early 80s. By the early 90s, 
Key people like um, Fakile Ban, Kaya Slanga, leading local branches, McQuay, uh, leading local branches, um, expanding that organisation out. Nonetheless, just to conclude, when it actually comes to the process of writing the constitution, this is something largely done by that small circle of human rights lawyers around Mandela, whose ties you can go all the way back to the 50s. Why? Perhaps two key reasons. Firstly, as I was saying, that kind of human rights global networks first instituted at Rivonia around um, Chastelson and Kentridge. Well, that expands during apartheid. And it's Kentridge, and in particular his wife, Felicia Kentridge, um, who gets hold of Ford Foundation funding, who get hold of um, the linkages to the US human rights movement. That's, these are the institutional linkages which make Arthur Chastelson Legal Resources Centre really the fulcrum of human rights law in South Africa in the 1980s. And of course, with all that expertise, that's why he goes on and you know, plays a key role in constitution writing. Second thing, probably being personal relationships. Bezos is Mandela's lawyer. When you're, on, when you're in prison, your lawyer becomes like a priest. You know, it's a close, close, intimate relationship. And when Mandela needs to outflank um, people in the ANC still committed to armed struggle, he uses people like Bezos to take back channel messages to Tambo in exile. And again, these guys have all known each other since the 50s. And that's why these Joburg human rights lawyers probably take a central role, I say probably, it's up for debate, I'm willing to discuss that, in the constitutional negotiations that run from 1990 to 94. Um, all sorts of oral history interviews suggest Mandela bypasses his own constitutional committee. The crucial drafting is done by his trustees, Bezos, Chastelton, Cheadle, Payson. Likewise, to conclude, so I'm going on until when it came to filling the constitutional court, controversy blew up around the appointment of Tori Madala. Tony Madala had practiced at the bar in Chansky. He had been only the fourth African judge in the whole of South Africa to be appointed to the bench in the early 90s. When he goes straight from the Transkei bench to the Constitutional Court, the legal establishment say, well, he's not practiced at Do Durban. He's not practiced in Joburg. Who's this marginal hick? You know, and he really took a lot of heat in his um, hearings, very unfairly so, I'd suggest. Probably didn't help him that um, the government also took some time to confirm him. That may well have been because he was a unity movement stalwart, not an ANC man, being a true son of Eastern Cape. Um, and that I think is how we might see the fragmented legacies of the Bantu Stan shaping the legal field in post apartheid South Africa, which I don't have time to talk about now, but to discuss um, if people want to do that. Tim, thank you very much. Martin, Martin, if I could ask you please as discussant to make your point. Well, uh, just let me say that uh, I'm very humbled to uh, be in this view since uh, I'm a mere journalist and uh, you know, my historical uh, background is, is slight, but I must say I look forward to this seminar more than any I've been to in very long time, so it was great, great pleasure that I'm here. Um, these are obviously two very rich papers and very diverse papers, and although they cover similar areas, and in a sense, particularly with Tudor's uh, presentation, there are many ghosts among us. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many of you remember the last time that Ellison and Macmillan were here and uh, clashed openly at the Institute uh, meeting and it was pretty, pretty strong stuff um, and everybody had a lot to say about it and I'm sure everybody in South Africa, this is held in South Africa, they have even more to say about um, what 
what you said to them. Um, you made, a, I thought, an extremely persuasive case, uh, and I think it's hard not to uh, concur with your conclusion that we have to keep an open mind that Mandela may have indeed told the truth. But of course, the conclusion will be turned on its head to say that Mandela may not have told the truth. Um, and it is, it is a very, very difficult area. I think you, you went through the material meticulously. Uh, but there are some elements which are, of course, not included in what, what you said. Um, I mean, I, you know, you, you particularly highlighted the role of naive Western liberals, and I suppose in some ways I would be included amongst those, certainly when in my time in Johannesburg in 1976, when I remember the distribution of material that was by the um, uh, Ian Smith regime in uh, Zimbabwe, highlighting the vicious attacks, the ripping of, of lips up by Mugabe and the cutting off of ears. And we all, as students, dismissed them 100% since they were produced by the propaganda wing of the Rhodesian uh, government. Today, I wonder if I would have been rejected in such union, you know, quite as easily. Um, so, you know, one has to, you know, if we're going to keep an open mind, we have to keep an open mind on all the evidence that we, that we find, whatever the source. Um, let me just raise a couple of questions with you. Um, the, what, the one group you didn't deal with were the seven quoted individuals um, who, had, who had given evidence in various ways in which they said that Mandela was indeed a member of the Communist Party and you know, he said or were hinted in that direction. The second one is the picture on Ellis's own one of his books where he shows uh, a group of the ANC uh, or Communist Party people meeting with Mao. How do you deal with that allegation that, and, and that those that had actually been agreed previously with Mao Zedong? Um, this is an extremely difficult area to, to deal with. And I think one of the issues that one has to accept as well is that if Mandela was a member of the Communist Party, and the Communist Party, and a disciplined member of the Communist Party, as he was maintaining as a disciplined member of the ANC, and the Communist Party had not spoken on this until after his death, then if he was, then he would have been bound to lie until the moment of his death. And one can't say that this was this is something that he was, this was not up for grabs. I mean, you genuinely were a disciplined member of the Communist Party, and I know members of the Communist Party, or people who have suggested they are members of the Communist Party in South Africa today, who still do not, frankly, tell the truth, because they're not allowed to. So, you know, this is a long, has a long, long shadow that casts down our history. And if we are to deal with these things, I think we have to accept that this is. This is an unfinished history. It's an, it's, and it, this, this shadow still hangs over us, which is why it produces so much heat. Let me then turn in um, briefly to Tim's work, which I was much more unfamiliar with. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are many people, um, including Colin, for example, who have much more to say about this. Uh, I thought it was fascinating what you, what you brought up and the relationship between the, the Bantu stands and their potential for producing uh, leaders, uh, both for the underground or the potential black economic empowerment uh, area, as a route out of poverty, as a route out uh, into the uh, wider world, is a fascinating one, I must say, one that I haven't really considered myself. The um, one area that I would remark on having worked on the rest of Africa uh, a fair amount, is that the story that you paint is of course one that you can find across Africa. And it's also one that in the rest of Africa has had, in some ways, a very deleterious impact on the continent. Because there was almost nobody in the African leadership across the continent, and I'm sure people can find examples where this is not true, 
uh, who were not either lawyers or teachers, and there wasn't all, there were very very few leaders that you can point to in Africa who didn't come out of that background. Therefore, had no business acumen whatsoever, had no idea how to grow economies. And if we ask, ask ourselves why Africa has struggled so badly and why it may or may not be considered the hopeless continent. I think that this, in a sense, has played some role in explaining it. Um, I think the point you make about uh, the, the constitution not being written by the uh, people in whose linkages were back into the Bantu stars is also fascinating. And the uh, Chastelson, Bezos, Hayson uh, triumvirate in playing that, uh, in writing the constitution. Um, of course, with Mandela you know, playing a supervisory role, is, is also fascinating. So that, in a sense, perhaps the moment of the uh, people who came from the Black Lawyers Association is now, rather than then. And uh, it, it's, I, I think you all will it for the fascinating. Not for me. Thank you very much indeed, Martin Clark. Um, Tula and Tim, do you want to reflect on... Yes, please do. Thanks, Martin, for mentioning the event which you had at the um, the, the Ellis uh, Macmillan engagement. Um, it was a very useful resource that it was actually recorded, and so it's available to be downloaded on the internet. And that's helpful with regards to your account of the seven SSEP members and what became of them. What Macmillan actually countered. Um, what he said during there, according to the recording, which I, I used as part of my sources for this um, paper. If you go to external mission, Joe Matthews is the SSCP member that um, Ellis gave the greatest amount of attention to. And what Macmillan countered Ellis with at that um, event was he said, Matthews didn't say that Mandela was a member of the Central Committee. He said he had seen him at meetings in 1960. And Macmillan added that Bob Heppel, who had been inducted into the Central Committee in 1960, quote, also attended those meetings in 1960. He said he never saw him. He wasn't there. Macmillan's point is that there's a diff there, there are different perspectives amongst people who were part of the Central Committee at the same time. It's very vague. People saying, I saw him there, and therefore I assumed he must have been. Uh, and what Macmillan would say, and I would actually back Macmillan on this, is that um, you know, there has to be some reason for giving these opinions greater weight than Mandela himself, who would have more reason to know than anybody else. So Macmillan's point is that there's actually a divergence in veteran accounts. Um, as McMillan said, you can find some fault with or can contradict every one of those statements of SSCP veterans on which Ellis was seeking to rest his case. So you need to actually go into those sources and analyse them and McMillan is saying that um, uh, Ellis was not as thorough as he should have been there. With regards to the SSCP and the, the photograph um, with Chairman Mao and the build-up to the armed struggle, remember the December 1960 meeting, extracts which I read, the SSCP decided to establish a trained nucleus and so Whilst they're not saying that they're going to wage armed struggle, they're saying they are going to equip and train people. There's actually an interesting anecdote in 1961. Oliver Tambo leaves in March to establish the ANC's external mission. And in exile, he meets people who he, re he remembers from the ANC inside the country, people like Raymond and Flaub and Walton and Pwai. And he wonders, why are you here? If you're outside the country, I'm the leader of the ANC in exile, and you're supposed to be going through me. And in, in Flaba, he's the leader of the group. And he says, we felt really bad that we couldn't tell him that we were going out for military training in China. It was organized by the party without the SACP knowing. So there's this channel which the SACP so has, ANC. ANC not knowing. They weren't able to tell him. He only found out later what was going on. So the SACP is pursuing its own independent channel. I'm not saying this is true because it needs to be explained, but one of the reasons why the SACP could be holding meetings with Mao a couple of months before is they've had this agreement to organise armed struggle, which is something happening independently of the ANC. Could his discipline have led him to lie about not having been a South African Communist Party member? That's possible. Something interesting to note, however, is that there were two ANC members of the same generation whose SACP affiliation was always rumoured, and the other one was Walter Sisulu. And Walter Sisulu's formulation, wherever people asked him whether he was a member of the party, he always used to say, I'm a scientific socialist. And he maintained that line. Eventually, before he died, he revealed that he was a member of the South African Communist Party. Before, you know. Mandela's line, when he was asked, 
was to say that um, if you mean a card-carrying communist, then no. Which could be a link to what Ellis wrote in his, about the party membership. You know, he had never actually went through the formality. But he never said during his lifetime, for what it's worth, he never said, I was actually an SSP member. To his death, even after 1994 liberalisation, where there's no need to actually lie, many SSP members came out into the open, like Tabo and Becky, and said they're SSP members. He continued to maintain, no, I wasn't. So for what it's worth, that's... Did he ever actually go through the formality of becoming a party member? This evidence suggests he probably didn't. That's why he felt so confident to keep repeating, I was never a card-carrying party member. So it's on his party, is that? After his death. And you know what? The whole aspect of Ellis, they say the reason why there is to correct self-serving narratives by ANC and SSEP politicians, creating narratives in the present day, distorting the past. Surely that same... Um, circumspection should be used to the attempts of the South African Communist Party the day after Mandela's death saying he was actually a member, although the ANC did say it as well. So as you say, it's not something which is completely ironed out. We can only base our judgments on the fragments of evidence we have. Okay, I'd like to open up to, please. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, post-colonial lawyers in general, white-collar professions, uh, Allow me in a sense to duck that question. I come from a family of teachers. Uh, none of us have ever known how to um, do enterprising Margaret Thatcher-like things. Um, um, but more broadly, um, to talk slightly more seriously, what I think is happening, again, I'm, I'm, I'm new to this aspect of history. I, I started off researching, you know, driving around the Eastern Cape, and it's only latterly I realised as interviewing lots of lawyers all the time, so maybe I should write something on it. Um, there's this project going on, um, a bunch of French scholars at the centre of it to talk about what they would call the post-colonial legal field, that nexus, as you say, of business, politics and law, and trying to construct a map, or as they say, you know, Chambre de Loi. Um, and um, some very interesting comparative conclusions might be drawn, say, between the way lawyers and business go together in South Asia as opposed to the way in various parts of post-colonial Africa. And i would be not nearly enough research done on it. Um, um, although people like, um, gosh, Zimbabwean friend George at the University of Edinburgh, thank you, yeah, writing about... Um, law in, in Zimbabwe. So it, it's an interesting question. I think we need to you know, fill in the colour a lot more. And second point, if Chaskos drafted the constitution, well yes, Nguyen now is the defender of it. Um, um, and I guess it's two points perhaps. One, it's interesting therefore to know the history of people like Nguyen, and I guess this is what I'm trying to push towards. Broader comparative point when post-colonial governments reach this kind of juncture that the ANC are at now, and the rule of law comes under question. It's interesting the kinds of middle-class movements that come up to protect the rule of law. And one thing that has struck me, just you know, reading South African newspapers online, as I'm sure everyone does is around things such as, you know, the state capture report and um, the immense pride, the immense assertion of professionalism of those black lawyers who went to court to force Zuma's government to get T. Madon Saylor's state capture report published in the open. And not just um, assertions of professionalism and the rule of law, but perhaps also, perhaps also assertions of a black professionalism. And my very final slide, um, Timberka uh, and Kai Toby apparently played a blinder in the courtroom that day. And the tweets, you know, that came out were, you know, pure excellence, black excellence. They make Eastern Cape. Proud, the three lawyers who went up against Zuma hailed from the Eastern Cape. Um, 
Um, and Tumbeka himself um, was probably the last year that the Transkei Law Bursary studentship was available, and he comes from the same um, Transkei, very small village as the Misun Sabeza, who also played a, a crucial role in that. So thinking through these networks and these assertions of professionalism at a time when perhaps Zuma can be stereotyped as the uneducated, um, um, corrupt, um, as opposed to professional, alternative trajectories of professionalism. Um, that dichotomy perhaps is one that is being debated at the moment. Um, so these are still provisional thoughts, but yeah, that's where I was hoping to go. Tim, thank you very much.